Google anything and they're just going to rank for it. Well, not anymore, apparently, right? It's not possible. There are no slots for exactly. your type of content to be able to rank in those on page one at all anymore. They reward you heavily for doing something. And then the next day they snap their fingers and it's like Thanos, you're gone. You get nothing. You want to rank in Google, you need to be the solution to a problem. You're not the one pointing at the solution to a problem. No such uh, warning for any small publishers over the last year, year and a half. And Danny Sullivan starts the conference by saying, look, it's not your fault, it's our fault. We kind of messed up. <laughs> In today's episode of the Authority Hacker podcast, we're diving into what might be the biggest shakeup in SEO this year. Google's massive crackdown on some of the internet's biggest names. Forbes, Wall Street Journal, CNN, these publishing giants just got hit with site reputation abuse penalties and have lost much or most of their affiliate traffic. In the case of Forbes Advisor, they've been completely de-indexed from Google. But here's where this gets really interesting. This isn't just another Google update. It's happening right as the Department of Justice is moving to force Google to sell Chrome and OpenAI's secretly developing their own browser. Plus, we've got major publishers banding together to track and monetize how AI uses their content. See the pattern here? The landscape of search is transforming before our eyes. The rules that worked for publishers yesterday they're crumbling today. And whether you're running a small site or managing a major publication, you need to understand what's coming. I'm joined today by my co-host and co-founder, Gail Breton, and we're breaking down why Google is finally going after these big sites and what's happened to the search results now that they have. What the new browser war means for your SEO and business strategy and how AI is reshaping the entire game of content creation and monetization in ways that people are only just beginning to realize. This is one episode that you do not want to miss. Welcome back to the Authority Hacker podcast. Today we have a number of very interesting stories. There's been a lot going on in the world of search mm -hmm. and AI over the last few weeks. And I want to start, Gail, by talking about Forbes Advisor, which is uh, a site or a part of a site that most SEOs kind of have learned to love to hate over kind the last few years. Kind of like a meme, years. right? It's like Forbes Advisor is basically an SEO meme at this point. It's like, ah, oh, like Google anything and they're just going to rank for it. Well, not anymore, apparently, right? Not at all, <laughs> because what's happened is Forbes Advisor, who we should point out, is a separate legal entity. They're a, a company within a company. Now, Forbes, the parent company, does own a percentage. I think it's 30 or 40 percent of Forbes Advisor. But Forbes Advisor is responsible for most of the affiliate content on Forbes.com. And there's a lot of it. Or Wasn't there was a, a story as well that they wanted to buy Forbes.com because they got so big from the affiliate revenue? So successful <laughs> that they wanted to to, to do do yeah. that. Yeah, uh, which just shows you how much money they've been they're making. And they've been expanding this to, to other sites as well, which we'll, we'll cover in a sec. Uh, but some of the content that Forbes Advisor has put on Forbes.com, which is a, a business news site, remember, uh, is best credit cards, uh, which you know not too bad for be, business site. It's not a million miles away from from the the site topic, but they also cover a lot of health topics, and they were ranking for best CBD products number one for for a long mm -hmm. time actually. And well, all these execs they, are like so stressed; they need to relax at some point, you know. So it's like it's oh, exactly, relevant, yeah. you know. <laughs> and for years, I mean, Google didn't did nothing about this. Forbes Advisor grew to. Uh, over 20 million monthly visits and most that's just the advisor section that's yeah. not all of forbes by the it's way it's high value visits and as well like it's like it's exactly these are people who are right at that buying decision making point they're they're searching for what what, what is the best product i can purchase to do x and forbes advisors is, is serving them uh, so anyway, on 24th of September of this year 2024, they started to lose a bit of traffic. And there were some murmurings around uh, the SEO space that they'd been received a, a manual penalty. Some people said that was true. Some people said that that wasn't actually the case. Anyway, it was in a little bit of a decline. Then their Ahrefs graph shows them jumping up again. I'm not quite sure what, what happened there, only to be completely de-indexed on the 19th of November. So to, to be clear, all of the content on the advisor subdirectory of Forbes has been 
de-index from Google. You cannot That's find so it on, on Google. And they've lost, I think, 15 to, mil, 15 to 20 million monthly visits from Forbes.com on, on Ahrefs. And there's more to come, like not all of it's been uh, fully crawled yet. So uh, we're looking at about 25 million monthly page views loss. Uh, can I just get your reaction to, no, to, to that? Like, no, the funny part is like, it's not even the fact that they got the index or not the index. It's the fact that Google had no problem ranking them number one for everything for years. Like we're talking like three, four, five years ranking for the advisor for pretty much any best keyword that they would write for to be like, no, this is not even worth being indexed in our search engine anymore. And it's like, it's, it's revealing of how Google works, which, you know, it's quite easy to point fingers at people who get penalized by these things or lose a lot of traffic, et cetera. But Google works that way. They just, they reward you heavily for doing something. And then the next day they snap their fingers. And it's like Thanos, you're gone. You get nothing. They just know half measure of like, you lose 20% or 30%. These are days, these days, they just heavily reward you. And then they just take everything away overnight, which is why people are really struggling to justify investing in SEO because of the volatility, basically. That's and that's like a prime example of that. And that's why Google sucks these days. <laughs> what was this though, objectively? Like forget everything Google's done in the past. That they've, they've done it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. In in November, 2024, was it a good move for them to pull this off? Ha has it changed anything? Uh, I mean, I, I did some searches, right? It's like part of me, I was like, okay, like who, who's who's there still? Like who, who has taken their place? And to be frank, like what I'm finding is like there's less of these, you know, big newspapers that write about everything, except maybe like uh, Wirecutter is still around, for example, like things like that. But like it's much more like specialized sites that I'm finding to rank for the thing. So it's like if you Google about supplements, like you will still have large publishers, but it's going to be like very well health or like that kind of stuff that is actually about health. And then you go Google about business topics and it's going to be business sites, even though they have a review section, etc. So it's like to me it felt like this like they're finally enforcing the like stay in your lane thing uh where it's like it's it's kind of allowed to do affiliate content but if you go too far they're just gonna they're just gonna catch you but it, it looks like basically google does not control the upper end of their algorithm and when you reach a certain level of authority you get to rank for everything and then they just have to manually correct for it uh which is which look is looking like what they've done with this, it doesn't look like a very algorithmic for most of it, right? Uh, I want to give you a bit of a challenge here. Um, so I looked up the top three pages by page value, which Forbes had, had lost. This is page value within Ahrefs. So I, I want you to guess what those topics were. <sighs> top three that they've lost over the last six months. I mean, CBD has to be up there, right? It's like, it's like CBD credit cards. Uh, like, so best CBD supplement, best credit card. And did they write about mattresses? Like that could be that could be one as well. Like best of mattress for back sleepers or something. I'm just thinking like so what's the highest value affiliate programs they could have written for, right? And then it's like has lots of search volume. So I've I've got them here. The first was best payroll services. Okay. These are kind of online SaaS tools for, for but payroll. But that's almost relevant for Forbes, which is crazy. <laughs> you could argue that. Yeah. I mean, they're a bit, they're, it's relevant for their clients. It's not so much relevant for like business news. Okay. Uh, but, you know. The second one was best voice over IP services. Okay. Interesting I, I, one. I, I don't think that's the ones that they made the most money from. Maybe the, because the value in Ahrefs is PPC, right? It's like the, the cost per click and they just calculate if you bought the traffic from AdWords. Uh, but the problem is like the affiliate program value is not included in this. I, I, absolutely, absolutely. But there is, there will be a correlation here, but it All was right. just interesting because these were significantly higher than, than most of the others. Uh, the third highest one was best SEO services. Okay, <laughs> makes sense. I mean, makes sense. The SEO industry is like a big uh, industry. and But it, again, it's because a lot of SEO agencies advertise for this, right? It's like, eh, funnily enough, SEO agencies have to buy AdWords to promote themselves. Therefore, the price of AdWords is very high. Therefore, the value in Ahrefs is very high. Um, the thing is like, you can make money by promoting these things, but there's no like big, broad affiliate program for like SEO agencies. Like you kind of need a partnership or something, which they may have, like it's it's possible they have that. Uh, but yeah, in my head, it's like CBD mattresses, like the stuff that really scales up, probably made them the most money, even if the value was high in Ahrefs actually. So you were talking earlier about what's replaced yeah. Forbes on the SERPs. So I, I went in and I had a look at this specific keyword, best SEO services. And six months ago, you had 
Reddit, you had two, two agencies, points. three newspapers, uh, Forbes and SEMrush mm. on page one, right? Uh, now you have Reddit. Uh, actually, the, the first three <laughs> results are the local map pack, the people also ask section, and the discussions and forum section. So one, mm -hmm. two, and three. We've all obviously got ads at the top of that. Uh, below that, we've got Reddit, which is, I get, what would that be, number four organic? Yeah. And then five through 10 are SEO companies, yeah. individual SEO companies. And this, I think, is what I'm seeing a lot of in the SERPs, mm -hmm. uh, not just in ones that Forbes has lost, but in general these days. Google is not serving other people who are talking about the thing. They're just trying to essentially give you the, the answer. What best SEO services, like, well, here's the best SEO services. Google's not saying that they're giving it, but they're, they're showing yep. SEO services, which they must somehow think are the best. I have no idea how they make that decision. But do you know but... why they're doing that? Because they're taking AI overview into consideration for this. So it's like, yeah. the point is like, you know, by the end of this year, a billion people will have access to AI overview. So now it's, it's something that they count with when they're essentially establishing the layout of a SERP, right? It's, it's counted. And the thing is like the informational part of that query is going to be served by AI overview. And if you want a list post, I imagine they will be served as like sources for the AI overview, right? And it's like, you're, clear, you're like, I want a list. Okay, you click in the AI overview sources and then, and or you just read the AI overview and you never click on the website. And then they basically have the ads and then they're like, well, now you we've served you the informational pieces in the AI overview. so the rest of the organic result will probably be the thing you want to buy directly because uh, you've already made that choice so not to do click. You, do you think that's what's happening right now, though? Like yeah, I see it everywhere. Determined from it. It's happening to us too, right? On Ontario Hacker, like we've lost a bunch of rankings on uh, affiliate program lists. Like we used to rank a lot for like, you know, like music affiliate programs, uh, software, SaaS affiliate programs, stuff like that. Um, and it's like, we're like, okay, well, did we do something wrong with our pages or not? And, and the more we're looking, the more we're actually not seeing other lists, like everyone who does lists as well is losing rankings right now. And instead is the affiliate programs themselves that are ranking. And it's like, it's basically a deep change in, in search intent for Google. And, and it's not something you can quickly fix, right? Unless we start spinning off affiliate programs ourselves. Uh, it's not exactly like we can take these rankings back. So it's like, it, it sucks a bit, but like Google is just changing. Uh, like they're making editorial decisions in how they're laying out the SERPs. Uh, and that, that's why it makes me kind of like smile when I see people talking about, oh, you can totally recover from this, et cetera. It's not Google punishing you. Uh, in many cases, like you will still show up, et cetera. It's just Google decided we do not want these list posts and these kind of like informational posts anymore in the SERPs that are commercial at least. Uh, we are going to put this in AI overviews and then the rest of the organic results is like, we don't want this anymore. We put this other stuff. Maybe you get one or two and that's it, you know? I think this is what Google said. I can't remember if it was Danny Sullivan said when he was talking. I think it was one of these creator summits with all the people yeah, who got yeah. hit com complaining. He was basically saying, uh, you are unlikely to recover to the, the same extent as you, you were yeah. before. And people took that as, oh, well, they're not reversing the algorithm. It's, it's, it's changing it. But no one really kind of clocked on to it's not just everyone's been been thumped in, a, in an update but like it's not possible there are no slots for exactly your type of content to be able to rank in those on page one at all anymore it's basically ai replacing you as a content creator for informational queries specifically so it's like you want to rank in google you need to be the solution to a problem you're not the one pointing at the solution to a problem so if you make a list of solutions they, they want ai to replace you if you are the solution, so if you are the service that people are looking for, if you are the product you're lo they're looking for, then they're looking to rank you up, which is why e-com is doing well, which is why services companies are doing well, which is agencies are doing well, because they are a solution to a problem and Google is starting to serve them more in the SERPs. And, and so like listing solutions was a very viable, like as I said, something that was very viable and drove a lot of traffic in the past and Google rewarded you heavily for that. So a lot of people, including us, did that. But it's changing. It's, uh, and, and the truth is, like, the more I talk to people, the more they're like, well, I don't even use Google. I'm using ChatGPT anyway for this stuff. And then it's just, like, branded queries that are coming up. Like, I think Ren Fishkin made a post about this recently where he's like, 40% of Google queries are now essentially branded searches, uh, which means, like, people are finding about the, uh, about the brand somewhere else, which is social media, chatbots, whatever it is. Then they go to Google, 
and they type the brand and they go on the site and people essentially attribute the conversion to Google traffic. But really what people used Google for is literally just the address bar. Like instead of typing the URL, they type the brand and they click on the first result, which is the brand unless someone buys that. Do, do you think then that people are now using AI to do that? Previously, people were using Reddit to do that or Google to Social search media, Reddit to, yeah, to yeah. find that and then kind of coming back to Google for the, the, the product. So it's really kind of, it's gone from finding information to just finding companies now? Pretty much. It's just like, basically, before you buy something, before you make a decision, you kind of like search for, for information about it, then you go on the website and you buy, right? Before, you would find information from articles that rank on Google. Now, more and more, you find this on YouTube, you find this on Instagram, you find this on TikTok, and you find this on Chatbot increasingly. And then eventually, people just make that journey directly to the website when they've decided, this is for me, uh, and they actually just, just buy the product. So it's like, and that's why we've been saying for months that you need a product, because if you don't have a product, you cannot be the solution AI or social media points at. And so like, if you're this in middle, like this in between guy, that's when you suffer the most. And that's why like, even like, I'm, I'm not bullish at all on content sites at this point, because, because of that, because essentially AI is just going to do a better job. Like ChatGPT knows about you, has memory about you, knows your problems, know all of that. And they have search built in now, et cetera. It's just not, there's no way you're going to beat that with a content site. Uh, and if you want like authentic information, I'm sorry, but like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube are better places than, than a blog at this point, you know? Uh, and so like, yeah, it's like people who are like, oh, but they're not going to have information to feed the AI. Yes, they will from social media. Uh, and a lot of people create content uh, they're, on social They're cutting media. all these deals, yeah. uh, OpenAI and even Google, cutting these deals with this Reddit, Reddit and is, uh, uh, other, other sources as well. You know, obviously Facebook has its access to, or Meta has access to Facebook and Instagram and all yeah. the, the threads. And 100% on OpenAI scraped YouTube illegally. Like when they asked the CTO about how they made Sora and they asked if they scraped YouTube, she like, that's kind of like a meme online on like how basically she could not answer the question. Because they obviously did it, right? They scraped YouTube and they have the YouTube information. And so like this idea that, ah, oh, if we don't publish on our website, there will be no information to train AI. I think it's, it's very biased because the truth is people post a lot more on social media already than they post on websites. And that's going to be the main source of training data. This, uh, so this, this story wasn't just limited to Forbes, though. There were many other big publishers hit here as well. Uh, I've got a list. The Wall Street Journal's buy side is 81% down. CNN underscored, which was actually, <laughs> CNN underscored was linked to Forbes Advisor. I think the same entity was publishing mm -hmm. content on, on both and was responsible for both. 63% um, decline there. Fortune recommends 72% decline. That's a big drop. Huh? That's like HCU level. Yeah, this this one, Time Magazine, 97% uh, <laughs> decline. And Newsweek Vault, Independent Advisor, The Sun Shopping, like all of these uh, got, got hit. And, and it's all centered around this site reputation abuse, which yeah, yeah. Google first published in their in spam documentation. And yeah, back in March when the core update uh, rolled out then. Mm -hmm. And conveniently, they gave they they were like, oh, we're giving big publishers two months to uh, adhere to this. No such uh, warning for any small publishers over the last year, year and a half. No, they just did it uh, right so away, right? A <laughs> little bit of a tour two tier system there, don't you think? Yeah, but at the same time, you know, it's like Google has always given a pass to big sites because they need them, right? They need them to get better results, and so like there's a much more of a dependency here than there is on small sites. But at least you cannot give them shit for not doing the thing they said. For once, they actually just destroy them. Now, the question is, like, it looks like a lot of these are manual penalties, right? And manual penalties, you can appeal to them inside uh, Search Console, right? And then you can essentially try to fix things. And quite often, Google restores a good chunk of your rankings when you do that. Um, so the question and the thing to observe going forward is what's going to happen when they actually do these appeals and do, do these sites recover any kind of rankings, right? Uh, and, and actually, it's quite interesting because Lily Ray tweeted about that. So Lily Ray, she's like this essentially SEO influencer, but she works for a big agency in New York and she works for a lot of these big publications, right? She helps them both with Google Discover and with SEO, right? And, uh, and basically, it looks like the first round of um, you know, the consideration request has been processed by Google and a lot of them got denied uh, even though a lot of that content was written by first party writers, which means, you know, Forbes writers, maybe not in the case of Forbes, but like the publications writers were writing the reviews and it still got denied uh, essentially a re-inclusion in the index. 
And so and, she, is, is that because they were too far off the core topic of the site or for some other reason? We don't really know, right? It's not exactly like they give you a, a huge detailed answer when they give you these things. It's kind of like cryptic and you, you need to be, it's a bit like an oracle <laughs> reading. <laughs> and you have to you know, read between the lines because they don't, especially for these big companies, it's like implied, like, you know, whatever Google says, like it can be used legally against them. Uh, in a court or something. So they're very, very careful in how they word these things and they're very vague, basically. But basically, like she's basically saying that it looks like the main issue is just that these publications have affiliate content at all. Uh, and she was like a little bit enraged at it, uh, which is interesting because small sites have been saying that for literally a year and a half. And there has been a bit of a war between like, you know, agency SEOs that work for big publications and, and, and big sites and essentially the smaller sites. And they've been pointed at when HCU happened, like, oh, you have too many ads, oh, like, uh, you don't have enough EAT, etc. And and now we're seeing the same thing happen to these big sites. Essentially, that, that's big sites HCU that's happening right now. Yeah, and, that's and, literally what it is. Yeah. And they literally have all these things that these big SEOs were pointed at, pointing at the small sites for not having, and it, the same thing's happening to them anyway. And now they're starting to understand that Google is actually being very biased against that kind of content. I don't know why Google is so biased against affiliate content, but obviously they don't want they don't want too much of it in their search results at this point. So you're you're, you're just to be clear here, you're talking about things like how they have all these uh, review panels and all of the like credibility EAT yeah, aspects exactly. on their site, but they still got hit presumably because they are doing too much affiliate thing, or we're not really exactly we're not sure exactly why, sure, but... and they won't tell you for sure. Like it's but. Yeah. You know, it looks like a, a political decision. <laughs> and now for a quick word from this episode's sponsor. Digital.pr. They've just launched the world's first subscription-based digital PR service that makes premium 100% white hat link building accessible to anyone. Through a mix of reactive PR, expert commentary, and data-driven campaigns, they guarantee a minimum of five to 20 high quality links from top tier publications every quarter. And this is not some shot in the dark approach. It's backed by search intelligence's proven track record and is made possible by the world's largest digital PR team, now accessible at the click of a button. Unlike traditional agencies that require huge retainers, digital.pr offers transparent monthly plans starting now from just £700 per month. That means no long-term commitments and no hidden fees, just guaranteed results. So if you want to level up your link building without breaking the bank, head over to digital.pr and join the revolution that's making premium digital PR accessible to everyone. And now back to the episode. And and there's there's been some backlash as well against some of the uh, SEO kind of auditors, I guess, if, if you want to call them that, um, back at this uh, creator summit, was it, that uh, Google... Google invited a bunch of people to, and it didn't go down so well, I heard. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like sad because you kind of like see the industry tearing it, itself apart as essentially tension rises uh, and some people are, are struggling more than others, etc. And then now it's like it's evening out, so people are kind of like, ah, you see, like you were wrong too, etc. But yeah, there was Nate Hake who owns uh, travellemming.com who got hit heavily by uh, HEU and that was very, very vocal about it. And it's kind of like leading the charge against Google, uh, stealing traffic basically. Uh, but he was talking about how people criticize Mary Hines, which is like another popular SEO, more on the agency side and consulting side, etc. Uh, that was kind of like auditing small sites that got hit on Twitter. You could argue for exposure, <laughs> um, like, and, and essentially sold expensive audits to a lot of these sites that ended up never recovering, right? And, and I think the, the content of a lot of these audits, I, I don't know Marie Haynes' audit specifically, but from, from what I've seen from, from others, uh, it tended to be, well, hey, look, your small affiliate site doesn't do all of these things which Forbes and these other big sites do, so that's why uh -huh. you've lost traffic and almost that's why you're not ranking. The reason Nate is so mad at it is because essentially people like that just justified the fact that these sites got hit when and then they went to the Google HQ and Danny Sullivan starts the conference by saying, look, it's not your fault, it's our fault. We kind of messed up. <laughs> and so that kind of like essentially, you know, makes these SEOs look like patronizing to small sites and you know they, it looks like they they they're, they're better, etc. And so like I can see a lot of like small creators not kind of like looking looking at them that worked for these big sites and the same things happening despite them having all the things they recommended in their audits and so on. 
And so like, it's really exposing a lot of the SEO industry's, you know, best practices as essentially being useless in these kind of cases. And it's very much an editorial decision by Google rather than you doing something wrong with your site, because even the sites with the most money and the most resources trying to essentially protect their asset as best as possible, because, you know, Forbes advisor wanted to keep their rankings. They made lots of money from it. They tried to put all the EAT, the schema, all that stuff, et cetera. That, that didn't help them. Um, and so, and so like, I, I think that's the ultimate case for like, yeah, all this stuff is not that relevant anymore. Maybe it was at some point. Um, and it's like, I don't fully but blame you, the SEOs you, for are it. You, are right? you saying this is like a underlying business model? Both I mean, from, a bit, right? You know, your site, not, not you, but like someone's site and also Google's business model. That is changing quite dramatically lot, as yeah. well. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like Google's business model. Google is threatened by ChatGPT, plain and simple. Like it's like AI is threatening their search business. They're making lots of money from from ads, etc. So they're doing things they've never done before. And and so like SEOs, they learn from patterns, right? They look at what happened in the past, and the way you would recover from a core update before was like auditing your website, pruning content, doing all these things, etc. Which it was legitimate for a very long time. And so like people repeated the same kind of advice when uh, these, these HCUs happened, et cetera. The, the thing is like, now we're seeing that it doesn't matter and that Google is essentially doing things they've never done before and these patterns are broken and you cannot just rely on past experience to decide what's good on Google anymore. Uh, and so like, I, it's like, that's why I f don't fully blame people like Mary Heinz, um, but at the same time, I understand why a lot of creators are quite sour about the kind of advice that she's giving and also her charging quite a lot of money for these kind of audits, you know? There's also been some shenanigans, I guess, reported uh, on Twitter uh, around Forbes specifically. So there was a, an allegation that they were moving content from the advisor that. subdirectory to uh, a port, forward slash portfolio subdirectory. And there's a few examples there of them, them doing that. And as someone posted a thread tagging in uh, go at Google search liaison <laughs> to kind of rat, rat them out. Uh, there was though a counterpoint My by uh, SEO, <laughs> SEO expert <laughs> Cyrus Shepherd that, uh, that 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 said that uh, Forbes had started moving content before they were actually hit, mm. and then people were reacting to that, saying, "Well, did they have some kind of early warning or heads up or things like that?" I mean, I'm I'm a little bit dubious as that they have like have you know, a direct line to Google as as such, but it's worth remembering that they had actually been losing quite a bit of traffic yeah. uh since like september october time so it's not surprising that they were like starting to take some action there i think that's maybe a bit more of a coincidence than that. i agree i think it's risk mitigation right it's like they knew they saw some stuff happening they felt like we felt it like a lot of sites started to lose steam a little bit etc they tried something different like it's an experiment that a lot of large companies run lots of experiments all the time i think that's all it was i don't think there was any kind of uh uh, conspiracy yeah. here and the people like to kind of like point at these things and be like ah oh, see they're treating these sites differently etc the fact that they, they got the indexed uh shows that it's like google is willing to go uh far the question is like how long do they stay the index for and do they just bring them back in the index within two or three months which is possible and that's when we can yeah. start pointing fingers at google and be like okay what about the small sites can they have the same thing please speaking of small sites then are there any Positive, is there any positive impact from all this for small publishers or is it just like a bit neutral? Because I think a lot of people were rejoicing when they, these sites got hit. But if you look at what's replacing them, it's not small publishers, it's businesses. I mean, if you're like a small niche business, it's positive as long as you, you're a business that sells something. So it's like you're an SEO agency, you're more likely to rank for SEO agency keywords now than you were six months ago. So in a way, like for the smaller guys, it's a good news. The bad news is you probably can't rely on the affiliate business to monetize your small business anymore from Google. Like you can still make money from affiliate, from YouTube, from all these things, from your email, etc. Um, but ranking, ranking reviews on Google is increasingly difficult, and it's something that it's like I would not spend a lot of effort doing now because uh, it's clear. Like, look, they they banned the biggest sites that have the most resources. Uh, it's clearly don't and, want and this like to be to be fair to Forbes and some of the other sites that were, were doing this, 
it wasn't like all of their content was universally bad, right? Some of it was actually fairly well. A lot of it was better than the covered. small sites, right? It's like it's like it wasn't yeah. amazing, but like it's not like all small sites are amazing either. Uh, and so it's like it, in some cases you could argue that even though it wasn't their core business, because they put more resources behind it, they they would serve something a little bit better uh, than many small sites. N not. To the extent to which they ranked, I think it was it was overrated, and the domain metrics helped a little bit too much here. But yeah, it's but overall, the way I see it is like I don't see affiliate reviews doing. I mean, they might do a little bit better for small creators, but the trend is still way down compared to like like you know, zoom out, look at two or three years, right? It's like wh where are mm. we at compared to a few years ago? It's not exactly like this changes everything uh, because the slots are not being replaced by a ton of other review sites; they're being replaced by actual businesses. Uh, so it's like, to me, this is a blip in history uh, and, and the trend is still the same. That's, that's the way I look at it, you know? Okay, so let's move on to our next story, which is uh, a bit of a doozy. Uh, so back in August of 2024, Google was declared an illegal monopoly uh, in the US. Uh -oh. And the ramifications for that were the, the Department of Justice, the DOJ, uh, had been trying to figure out what to do, how to like punish them for this. And the thing that they've come up with is that they want to get Google to sell or divest Chrome. Mm. So if if all goes to plan, and that's a big if because this is being appealed vigorously, uh, if if it goes ahead, then Chrome will no longer be owned by Google and presumably uh, become its own entity or sold off or something like that. Uh, this obviously has huge ramifications for search, for SEO, for Google as a company and for its development well. of yeah. AI, for ads specifically. In fact, I think that's that's, that's where the we biggest one, right? Start, well, that's where we should start because ads make up uh, around 70%, maybe even a bit more of Google's total revenue. That's despite them creating all these new devices and phones and you know the android store mm. and their cloud services and all that that's still a tiny percentage of their their income um so why do you think selling or uh losing access to chrome data will have such a significant impact on google's ability to serve ads i mean basically the way you can charge more for an ad is if it's being put in front of the right people that click on the ad and end up buying the thing you're selling, right? It's like you, you tend to advertise to sell something. So it's like, if I tell you that there's 10% chance that someone clicks on it and buys the product, you're willing to pay a lot more than if I tell you there's 1% chance that people click on it and buy the product, right? So in order to actually do that matching very well, you need to know a lot about the user. So it's like you need to know which websites they've been visiting, but not only, right? Think about how TikTok works, for example, like even stuff that you mouse over, even stuff that you slow, like slow down your scrolling over and start looking at, et cetera. That is information that tells me like it's interesting to you. And it's like, if I start showing you content related to that, then you're probably, you're more likely to essentially click and buy. Uh, and so this, this, by the way, is just sorry to interject. This, by the way, is why so many people are convinced that their phones are listening to them because when they talk about a vacuum cleaner, suddenly they get ads for vac vacuum cleaners. But it's not that. That's actually been looked at very, very closely. And there's been loads of studies on this and they've never been able to prove it. But it's just because their ads targeting is so good. They know all these like micro actions that someone looking for vacuum cleaners will do on other types of content especially on, on things like social media as you as you said yeah and it's like the thing with chrome is it's kind of like a window into like 90 percent of what you do on your computer right it's like most of the content you're going to consume at least on desktop on mobile quite different because there's different apps etc and that's why they have android because it kind of makes up for that um but like it, it gives uh, it basically gives all these signals similar to what TikTok has. And then that allows them to, uh, through essentially, the, you know, the, the, the pattern match, right? So I'm like, oh, Gal and Mark, they check the same kind of stuff. And Mark, I know I have conversion data from the AdWords pixel that he bought like a new vacuum cleaner the other day. So I'm gonna show the ad for the same vacuum cleaner to Gal who has the same browsing patterns and therefore his chances of clicking and buying are high. And so I can charge more for this ad, right? And so that is, yeah, Chrome and Android. And then if they lose that, they lose the ability to match the ads with people. 
and therefore they can charge a lot less for ads because the conversion rate is going to plummet because they're not going to be able to match the ads of people. So while Chrome on its own does not make money, it is the engine that allows their ad platform to make a lot of money. And so that's going to make it quite challenging. And now the thing as well is like, well, what happens to Chrome, right? One, you know, they become their own browser and they sell the data to anyone who pays for it. Uh, including back to Google. I including Google, which means that the, the ad engine doesn't break at this point, but it means, for example, Meta now starts to have more data than Google because they have their own proprietary data from you using Instagram and, uh, and Facebook and WhatsApp and everything. Plus, they can buy the Google data, see what queries you typed and all of that, basically. Uh, Th that's actually a very, very significant advantage to Meta there because they already have access to a huge amount of data that Google that they doesn't. Don't share, and they're yeah. on par or even better than Google in many ways for, for ads. The two companies, by the way, make up more than half of all digital ad spend in, in the US, just those two companies. And I think that power balance would be affected quite significantly by Meta having access to this data. I'm even wondering if that doesn't make Meta like too powerful to let yeah. them access that data. So I'm wondering if that doesn't trigger another like uh, uh, antitrust suit against Meta following that, where they also have to start sharing their data or something. You know? That could be a good defense in Google's appeal yeah. as to why this shouldn't happen because Meta right? will get, get hold of it and it will be anti-competitive. But also, you know, Google uses that data for search, right? So they, they like, we know that they use the snap boost signal that essentially uses clicks, et cetera, and probably a lot of data. So just, just, just to step in there, if you haven't heard of nav boost, this was one of the uh, ranking factors, I guess you call it, which was released in uh, earlier this year, not released, but <laughs> uncovered when, when uh, some, someone else released <laughs> okay. against their will. Yeah, the, the Google leaks, as, as they were. And over on the Authority Hacker News channel, we did a few videos about that back in May. Uh, and it's, it, it, what is NavBoost and what, what is the signal kind of like say? Uh, we, we don't know exactly how it's used or whatever. It's just like an ingredient Google has access to, and then they can put it in the recipe of the algorithm. But that is basically user engagement data, click data. Yeah. Uh, and so like they need to get that data from somewhere. And it's very likely Chrome is one of the main ways they collect that data together with Android, together with maybe Google Analytics or stuff like that. I haven't read the terms of service, but think about Google services in general and how they could get that data, like Gmail as well, like the stuff you click on and so on. That would probably feed that data that is then used as part of the algorithm to decide what ranks and what doesn't which kind of makes sense. Like uh, we talked a lot about that in previous podcasts where we see lots of like creator sites doing well in updates, um, which like, you know, they tend to have lots more like brand searches, et cetera, and that kind of stuff and direct clicks and clicks from uh, Instagram and so on. So you can imagine they use all that data and they're like, oh, this is popular, let's rank it up. So yeah, if if they use that to for their search algorithm and what that means is, is part of their competitive advantage to being a better search engine. A better search engine can be, Challenge here, but you get the idea. Uh, the point is like all their competitors could start having access to that data. So the joke is like, oh, Bing's gonna have access to it and it's still gonna be a shit search engine anyway. Uh, but the, imagine if OpenAI has that data, for example. So like OpenAI is, is much more of a threat to Google. Like they've overtaken Bing already in traffic uh, with ChatGPT and the search function is not even free to everyone yet. It will be next year. Um, but like imagine if they start being able to have access to click data and they're able to see essentially what's popular and not popular on the internet based on what people click on, and then use that information to as background for AI answers in search, right? So it's like, instead of just randomly searching, they use Bing right now, uh, they use the Bing API to actually get uh, data for your answers with search, but what if they're able to see what people are actually reading and liking online and use that as, as the base for the AI answer? They could serve much better search results with their search GPT than they do today, uh, and that would challenge the search engine as well as the ads would be challenged by Meta. So it's like it's really breaking up the competitive advantage of Google on almost all fronts it, when it comes to advertising, you know? It's knocking down a very significant wall or moat yeah. around what Google's built and it affect, affects literally everything that, that Google does. That's why they're um, so it's a big deal. So this and Android against this. They've, they've gone as far as to call it a uh, radical interventionist agenda. Uh, claim, and Google claimed that this would alter business models, increase device costs, weaken Android's competitive position against Apple, and complicate efforts to maintain Chrome security. Usual kind of lawyer speak for 
uh, you know, when they're trying to influence public opinion and why this would be so bad for, for the world. But is it bad for the I world mean, or is it just bad for Google? I think short term, it might be bad for the user, actually. Mostly because, let's say Chrome becomes its own company, needs to make its own money, basically, right? Uh, it's like, sure, they can sign a deal with Google, but your data is not going to be just given to Google anymore. It's going to be given to anyone who buys the data. And so, like, essentially, you're less private on the internet and your information. But pre presumably, though, this is kind of like it's anonymized in a way. Yeah, it's not it like will some be. Google it employee can come and look up your search no, history. No, that's, but... that's not how it works. But, like, what it means is you'll be more bombarded with ads. You'll, like, you know, it would be more, a bit more obnoxious and, in the way you're being this sold. This is stuff. actually a, a question I, I want to ask because, as someone who's recently gone through the transition to switch to from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Uh, Windows to Apple and from Android to to iOS, mm. I'm like inundated with all these privacy options and like honestly, it's been really difficult as someone that grew up on Windows <laughs> to figure out how I need to, to enable this so I can get my back. freaking camera to work mm -hmm. uh, because like I'm just used to having no privacy on on Windows, I guess. Um, so it's there's a little bit inconvenient, uh, but I wanted to ask about the ad targeting because there's always this option on, on Apple devices, ask app not to track, right? Mm -hmm. And what that means is that app's not sending data back to wherever and they're not, they're not able to understand what we're doing. So does that just mean I get the same amount of ads, the ads are just, just more, less shitter, relevant. shitter and less <laughs> relevant to me? Pretty much. So I don't know if that's a good thing in the sense yeah. that I'm not squandering as much money or a bad thing and it's like why is there a picture of this is nothing is i'm not interested in that you it's know? a bit of a different debate but privacy to apple is is a is a product basically it's like yeah. it's a way to justify them charging more for the same thing uh and and so like the way they sell privacy is is pretty shitty in the sense that it tends to make marketing less relevant to the users that leverage their privacy features so if you use chrome on your mac you're not more private. Like they still get the data. Uh, it's only if you use Safari, for example. Same with Mail. Like you need to use Apple Mail to get the privacy features. If you don't, then then the, your privacy is pretty much the same as on a PC. Uh, and and they really mess it up. Like on email, for example. Yeah, they automatically open all emails on Apple Mail, so you cannot track a user's activity based on email. And you might still email them even though they haven't opened your emails for for years, for example. And that's that's pretty annoying. Uh, and you need to rely on things like click data to actually fix that. So it's like, that, I don't want to go in that debate, but yeah, it's not it's not great. So, well, I'm sorry, I'm I'm going in that debate. Right. Um, <laughs> here's a here's a philosophical question for you. Uh, maybe this is one for the philosophy uh, podcast. All right. Um, is it good for the world that there's wasted ad spend, or does the world as a whole benefit if everyone advertising everywhere the cost per conversion is much lower? Uh, surely that means that the price of things can come down, markets are more efficient, yeah, it's, yeah. it's better to do that. So my argument uh, would be, I'm not 100% for this, but I'm just saying that uh, if Chrome is divested, it's its own entity selling data to everyone, everybody's advertising in theory gets cheaper. If you want a product, you spend less less money to advertise. Consumers, you can, you can in theory pass that saving on to consumers if market forces work. I know they don't always. Is it a good thing? I mean, potentially. The problem is like how privacy is being sold to the end user, right? It's like basically people imagine just looking at their internet history and reading their text messages. Yeah. And so like, they imagine that's how it works, which nobody cares about your text messages, uh, but it's being analyzed by essentially algorithms, AI, which has been leveraged first before we had all ChatGPT, et cetera, for ad targeting. Uh, and that's why Meta is making record profit right now because they've been leveraging their progress in AI for ad targeting. And it's also why Meta has very relevant ads much more than other platforms because they have no privacy. They just, they're like, just like Google, they use all your data. So yeah, um, essentially it's better to share the data. Uh, the problem is public perception is so bad in terms of privacy, it's been painted as this really bad thing. It's very similar to like nuclear energy for the environment basically. Uh, how mm -hmm. it's been stigmatized. Uh, the perception when, is completely different from when reality, it's actually yeah. probably the the most practical way to actually maintain our lifestyle while reducing emissions. Uh, so it's it's very very similar. Uh, and 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 so for that reason, there is always a push for privacy because it gains you market share and because it yeah. it wins you political goodwill. Uh, and and yeah, that's that's the thing. But it's not necessarily better. It's just people feel like it's better. So 
you and I were talking about this last week, but there, there, there's always the chance that the DOJ, instead of forcing Chrome to become its own entity, forces Chrome or Google to sell Chrome to someone else. But then mm. we were kind of debating, well, who who would buy this? It's like 10, 15 billion dollars, yeah. Who would buy this and, and not instantly create like another monopoly, you know? Because Chrome has 72% of the browser market, a, a little bit more if you include the Chromium-based browsers like Microsoft Edge and uh, Arc, which you've been using a bit. That's the thing, but that, that's the problem is Chromium, right? Because Chromium is essentially the underlying technology behind like most browsing on the internet at this point, uh, apart from Safari and Firefox. Uh, and, and, the, and the thing is like, because Google makes so much money, they invest in it, they make the technology better, the web has gotten faster and easier to navigate, et cetera. If it becomes like its own for-profit entity, the incentive is not going to be as big because Google was like, well, if people browse the web more, we, we display most of the ads on the internet. Well, great. Like uh, that makes sense. Whereas if they have to make money on their own, they, it's likely they will have more trackers loading, more things like that, et cetera. And that's going to, to make your experience worse as a user. And, and, and yeah, that's what I'm saying in the short term. I think it's, it can be detrimental if they sell it, even though like I'm all for breaking up Google, but uh, I, I think it, there would be a period where it would be lost before it gets better. Is there any other way that makes sense to break off uh, part of Google to break up Google? I mean, to, to me, this is like, it's the cleanest thing. It's the easiest thing. And I think it's probably the area of the business that the deal that GOJ thinks they're most likely to win because of that 72% browser market share and all the history of browser uh, things with, uh, you know, uh, Internet Explorer and Microsoft's uh, antitrust case back in the day. I think there is actually, I think if they force them to sell YouTube, uh, that would be another way to break it up, mostly because traditional search is losing steam anyway. Um, so you could argue that, yeah, it's winning for now, but like display ads on websites, if websites are not visited that much anymore, not that big of a deal. If people use search less and move more to chatbots, it's going to naturally kind of like even out. But video is the growing format here. So it's like, in my opinion, like mm -hmm. the next unicorn from Google is YouTube actually. So if they forced YouTube out, that would change things a bit. And then it's like Meta starts being able to like display their ads on YouTube as well as Google and they compete on that, et cetera. Like that, that could break up Google in a different way. That could be just as relevant, I think. And so I guess the, the third potential outcome here is that Google wins its appeal or, you know, the DOJ's actions get diluted significantly and they get to keep on to Chrome, but just have to change a few settings somewhere. You know, something like what happened with Microsoft when but you uh, choose a search engine rule. yeah something like this when you boot it up and they kill the deal with apple or something yeah 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 i think that apple deal which actually they have the the deal with firefox as well mm -hmm. to be the default search engine on there and safari and th that's there's quite a lot of money that they're paying for this yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's it is you don't have to be a, a lawyer to realize that's probably anti-competitive uh, uh, what they're that doing. is but this is also the only way to monetize a browser without killing the experience. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult otherwise. Uh, and so that's why it's like, the problem is like the browser market could collapse if making deals with Google does not work. Unless OpenAI sweeps in and starts paying high prices to just compete with Google directly or something like that. Like it seems like they really want to take that market share. Um, so it's like, possibly. Which is a great transition to our next story, which is the new browser wars. Because uh, this this is actually heating up. Like, forget all the DO, DOJ stuff, forget Google selling Chrome, but OpenAI is currently developing a browser, which it says it wants to use to compete with Chrome. Did they uh, say internally that? They're, yeah. Okay. Internally, they're calling this Natural Language Web or mm. NL Web. Uh, it's still some way away from launching. Uh, we don't know what that, that means, whether that's months or, or years, but they've been on a hiring spree. They've recruited uh, Ben Goodger and Darren Fisher. Darren was, uh, he worked on the original Chrome project. He was one of the original developers and mm. also over at Arc, which okay. uh, we talked about earlier. You, it's a browser you, you've switched to, but they've, they've stopped development now, right? Yeah, so I mean, they're basically like, they called the browser company. Their goal was to make, to reinvent the browser, which they did. A lot of people really like Arc. The problem is it became kind of like a nerd browser with like lots of advanced features. And they're kind of like a venture back company. They need to make a unicorn to make it worth it. Uh, it's like, it's not good enough to make a hundred million dollar company. They want a billion dollars basically. 
Um, and as a result, it's like they actually stopped the development of Arc and started a new product because it wasn't broad reaching enough. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really good browser. It's got a lot of momentum. Like their growth was insane and they still stopped it. And the, all the nerds are mad at this point because uh, the, their favorite browser is not developed anymore. And this is, this is really comes back to the money issue, right? It's because it's notoriously difficult to make money. And that shows, yeah. No one mm -hmm. wants to pay for it. Exactly. Uh, Firefox, 80% of its revenue, 80% of its revenue comes from Google yeah. paying them to be the default search engine. And that's the reason it continues to exist. And probably something Google's doing strategically, not just to get people uh, to use google.com for search, but to kind of, you know, pretend that they're not yep. a monopoly in the, the browser <laughs> browser space. And something similar for Safari, though, that's slightly different with uh, getting it's into It's not paid by ecosystem. Google, but... Uh, it's just Apple wants the Apple sells you the privacy is part of their feature set that uh, is their marketing yeah. basically. Uh, so yeah. yeah. So why does OpenAI want to create its own browser? What's the is this a data play as well? Uh, I think it's kind of like every kind of like really big platform needs to control some kind of operating system basically. So uh, and that's kind of like you know like Google has Android for example and they had like Chrome OS but it, they're looking to phase that down for Android. So Android really is their platform. Apple has iOS, macOS, et cetera, like all the all their OS. Microsoft has Windows. Uh, they kind of failed their transition to mobile with Windows Mobile. But And then Facebook has been complaining for decades that they never had an operating system, and that's why they can't grow. <laughs> and that's why they've invested so much in like the metaverse, for example. Like this, nobody cares about it anymore. But the reason why Mark Zuckerberg was like, I'm going to take my pile of money and risk it all on VR is because of his frustration with not op owning an operating system that essentially anchors you in people's lives so much more than, uh, than just having a product. And so OpenAI, they have this ambition, right? They want to be the next Apple. They want to be the next uh, phase of Meta, et cetera. And so they need an operating system. And seeing the success of Chrome and essentially the browser being how you operate most things on your computer, for most people at this point, apart from maybe creative tasks, it's kind of like the easiest way to do that because selling a computer and making a computer or making a phone or something like that, it's so much more difficult. Whereas a browser is a, just a software play that plugs into that, but you kind of hijack the operating system of the user uh, and, you, and you get control. So yeah, it's collecting data, but it's mostly anchoring yourself in a way where you're hard to remove. And that's why they want Google to sell Chrome because they're hard to remove now that everyone's using Chrome. And so, yeah, OpenAI is going just for the same playbook at this point, I guess. Is this also like a distribution play? I mean, yeah. We saw Meta AI get to 500 million monthly users uh, in a very short space of time because they have the Facebook apps, Instagram apps, and they just stuck their AI in there. So it's a, and bam, 500 million people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and and you can see as well the macOS app for ChatGPT, right? Is kind of like also kind of like becoming this distribution point as well. You can start seeing your screen now. Uh, you have a keyboard shortcut to like call it from any place, etc. So yeah, it's just like they, they, want, they want most people to use their product because that's how they become the next, uh, you know, the next Apple, the next Google, the next whatever. And so the browser is the smart play. But the, the interesting thing is like, you look at how they're tackling search, right? They didn't just copy Google. They made something different. Like search GPT is a fundamentally different experience than Google, but there's still links, etc. And so OpenAI, they're not a company that's just going to copycat and do the same thing, just slapping their thing on it, because they know nobody's going to switch uh, if you do that. Just it, why would I? Um, and so like, what's going to be interesting is like, what's their take on the browser? And knowing they're an AI company, my, my gut feeling is their browser is going to open a lot less websites than Chrome's browser that relies on search results with mixed organic and, uh, and paid results, right? Uh, so my, my gut feeling is if if they release the browser and it became popular, which is not a given necessarily, but they're on a fast growth trajectory right now. As I said, they overtook Bingo already. For website traffic would tank further, basically. Like people will regret Google actually at this point. <laughs> That's a scary, <laughs> scary thought yeah. to, to ponder, right? I mean, makes sense, right? They're a generative AI company. They generate the content for you. They don't need the websites nearly as much. What What would they have to do like what features would they have to include or how good would their browser need to be to get people to switch away from this Chrome, which they've had installed for 10 years? 
I mean, it depends who you're talking about, right? If you're talking about me, it just needs to have like a nice color and it's fine. I'll just switch to it <laughs> and, and that's fine. Um, but like, think about the Chrome extension library, for example, right? It's like, would you switch if your favorite extension did not work? Probably not, right? Yeah, uh, it's harder, yeah. Like, it would be quite difficult. It means like all the integrations you have with like Notion and the tools, maybe a two-factor authentication plugin, like that's what I have, for example. It helps me like picture in picture for videos and so on. Like, I don't think I would switch if it wasn't available, which tells me that if they develop a browser, it will never be developed on Chromium, uh, which mm -hmm. ties us back to our previous story. Because if they develop it on Chromium, then, then extensions work and it's the same base technology and it's open source. So in principle, they can take whatever Chrome is today and fork it in their own direction without owing anything to Google, basically. Um, so yeah, I don't think they can make a mass market product that is not developed on Chromium at this point. It would be so much work. Unless it's something really far away from what we consider to yeah. be a browser at, at the moment, right? It's a different take then, but then they, but they need to integrate with whatever you're already using, which it sounds like the extent, like migrating most extensions and getting most people to use it, it's like, it, it would be quite challenging. What they could have is they could have a porting kit, right? They could make like a, essentially a software that allows Chrome extension uh, developers to in one click make their extension work on their browser and have a different rendering technology. But you also have to consider most websites are built for Chrome at this point. Like when I build my mm. website, I test it for Chrome. And if you have a different rendering engine, if the if the tech behind rendering the web page is different, it's quite likely websites could break, etc. So either OpenAI doesn't give a shit for website rendering because they don't give you many websites anyway, or they're gonna have to be quite close to Chromium. And then in that case, you might as well start from there. So I suppose uh, it's possible that they can use their their technology to kind of present what's on a website, the information in in a different way, right? The same way that you know, perplexity or uh, tools like that will, you'll do a search and it will yep. summarize, it will almost create a new web page about what that web page is in a very like search GPT. way at the moment. Basically it's uh, search GPT as default search, right? Yeah. It's like, that's so that's... It's, it's like all, all of these access points to AI, you know, the doing the search in the, in the browser, using the app, using your voice, like, and, and the way it works mm -hmm. um, in, filtering information and presenting it to you in a different, easier to understand, concise way in the way you want. I, I feel, I, I don't quite see it yet, but there's like some inflection point where this all just comes together and- You know what I very think? New. I think they will, so the next year is supposedly the year of agents where AI doesn't just reply to you, but does things for you. And we do a lot of tedious things on the internet, like oh, booking plane tickets, comparing prices, uh, hmm. filling forms, uh, replying to emails, et cetera. Like lots of tedious things that could be done potentially by an agent by the time they release this. So my guess is that their browser is going to be agent based and it's going to start doing the things that you don't want to do on the internet hmm. rather than you browsing and doing the things. And so that would get me to switch. Imagine if I don't have to, like if it filters all my emails for me and pre-drafts everything, automatically because it just can use the tools, you know? I think if we if we take it back to just basic actions that end users, day-to-day -day end users do on the internet. So let's say um, I'm buying a vacuum cleaner for for Christmas yeah. or something. What's Exciting the best vacuum Christmas. cleaner to buy? <laughs> uh, or I want to uh, go on vacation to Spain. Like, you know, you, know you, you have to perform a number of actions to figure out where should I go? What time of year should I go? What flight should I get? What hotel should I get? What should I do? But if if they're able to perform all of those actions and just present to you in a very custom way based on what it knows about you, exactly. all your previous searches, data, email, et cetera, already, just as here, Mark Webster, here is your specific optimal itinerary for your, your vacation or your ideal vacuum cleaner because I know what type of house you have and you have a dog and mm -hmm. that affects this and et cetera, et cetera. Well, imagine it goes through your email and it's like, hey, the, um, the warranty for your washing machine is about to expire. Do you want me to extend this? Yes, no, that's gonna cost $99, let's say. And you just click yes. And it just does all of it for you. It contacts the supplier, it does it. It reads your emails, it knows it's gonna expire. And then you just open a new tab. It's like, hey, by the way, this is expiring. Should I handle it for you? And you say yes, and it does it. There's layers I to switch. that though as well, because you, it presents you with a decision. Yeah. But there's another layer where it, it, it makes a recommendation 
yeah. about that decision based on what it knows about you. So it knows how much money you have in the bank and how, how many exactly. warranties you bought in the past and how risk averse you are and all these types of things. And it's like, based on your circumstances, it's probably not necessary or, you know, this would protect you from this, this and this happening. So in my opinion, the browser is basically the chat GPT app that has a browser built in where you can eventually browse websites, but you try to get the AI to do most things for you and you interact in a much more like natural language way with things. And it just, you don't have to think about things. It just goes through everything as context and just tells you, you should probably look into this. You should probably think about that uh, based on what I know you like. You probably should check this out, et cetera. Um, and, and this would make me switch, actually. I would switch for that. Yeah, I mean, that'd be very interesting. And we were just speculating here, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, don't like, know what's, what's going to happen, but... It's getting yeah, there. Yeah, that is the kind of the AI future that we were kind of sold on in the, the, the beginning of like when it starts to get pretty scary. It's, it's basically where it's going. Like, I mean, we have Claude that can use your computer already. Uh, like they, they just released a, a new kind of like API thing that allows it to interact with like uh, more apps and so on. Like the ChatGPT app can also interact with like coding apps on your computer now and so on. So really the next step is having it do the thing rather than just give you the answer in a chat that you copy paste somewhere else. Um, and, 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 and I think the browser would be an excellent vehicle for distributing these to most people with like a paid option for it to do more things or whatever. Uh, and that would be, that would be how they go about it. So yeah, I, I think that's how they get it. I don't, I think anything less people won't switch. Just to throw some more AI, uh, nihilism, I guess out there, uh, I was watching a podcast, uh, the weekend by Y Combinator. Um, mm -hmm. who do a lot of kind of um, like investments in startups and they run all these kind of like early stage uh, growth incubators, things like that. And they're sort of saying that there's a huge opportunity for this like vertically integrated AI SaaS product, like to replace a, a, a SaaS tools in specific, mm -hmm. specific markets. So AI agents that will, will do that. But that's a short to medium term thing in five, six years, uh, th they reckon that most experts, most things people are experts on, um, there will be an AI, uh, one AI that has like a, a grand um, software or whatever um, you would describe it that can do everything better than most of these experts, 80, 80 90% of the time. So kind of like, we've talked about the, this kind of like scary AI future stuff before, but really like it kind of makes you think like is is everything we're doing now just going to be go away in three or four years probably as a business <laughs> <laughs> probably uh, i mean yes probably but the thing is like so that's why you need to do things that have value now uh and you need to extract value quickly because the landscape is changing so fast the the, the focus of businesses should be on basically surviving today like b putting money in the bank today like making long-term bets is quite challenging i'd say right now uh, unless unless you have access to these big companies and, and, and you know things like, yeah, the challenge, especially for web publishers, should be just do what works today and put yourself in a position to take advantage of the next wave when that presents itself. And speaking of the next wave, there's one small story I want to finish up with. There's a company called prorata.ai who claims to have developed a way to track which content, which source content is being used by different AI models when it, it gives output, right? So if you go to Google and it's AI overviews answer presents some information, they claim to be able to determine which sources, which original pieces mm -hmm. of content that came from. So they've signed up a bunch of major publishers, Time Magazine, The Atlantic, Guardian, Universal Music Group, Financial Times, Sky News, uh, and more uh, in an attempt to create what they called a movement, but the, the CEO was being interviewed on CNBC uh, the, was challenged saying, this sounds more like a union demanding fair prices for actually. your labor. And that's, it's a really interesting analogy. It's maybe something uh, akin to how the Spotify um, algorithm, not algorithm, but the Spotify licensing agreements work, where when your content is streamed, um, you get a very small amount of money each time that happens. So they want to create a, a network where when Google or anyone else uses content that the original creator gets paid. Is this realistic? 
Uh, and what do you think the implications of something like this might be? I mean, first of all, their system needs to be fucking amazing because if it's not, like these platforms are gonna, dis they're gonna prove it doesn't work well and they're gonna dismiss it. They'll be like, look, this is not even working properly. Why would we use this? And then end of story, right? So it's like, I haven't tested it. But big, big caveat there, yeah. <laughs> exactly, because like that's the easiest way to not pay anything is to just say it doesn't work, right? Uh, and it's not possible. Like I'm, I'm very surprised that an external company could do this when the companies that themselves build the models and know what they put inside aren't able to do this. Uh, it's like it, it, it looks like an uh, like a desperate attempt by large companies <laughs> to get paid for this. But unless there is legal, like unless governments are pushing for this. I don't see this going anywhere, to be frank, because nobody's forcing these companies to do anything about it at this point. There is some cases, right? I know there is New York Times against OpenAI. I know there is a perplexity being sued, et cetera. Like, it's happening. Um, so it will really depend on like how these things go, but uh, I think companies will not want to give control of like such an important part of their company to a third party. So I would imagine it might inspire them to build a similar system eventually. But I just can't see this company do well, actually. It's really a union. It's really just a, a way to protest and try to be a bit logical about it. That's, that's how, how I see it. How bad is our LLMs right now at just scraping everyone's data without consent, even if people are specifically trying to block it? I mean, it depends who you're asking for. Like, basically what's happening, it even happened to Google, to Apple, sorry, which Apple is like, you know, they want to be ethically super clean, et cetera. But they basically buy data from third-party providers. So there's, like, there's companies that just scrape data and they just sell it to these companies and they're like, they train the data. The problem is it's kind of like money laundering a little bit because the scraping companies, they don't give a shit. Nobody knows about them. And all they want is just a good data set to charge for. And then the companies that create LLMs, they, they need data. They're, they're so hungry for data, otherwise they can't make a model that's competitive with uh, everyone else, right? And so it's kind of like uh, uh, they basically made a layer of companies that just do all the gray hat stuff, steal the data, and sell it to the companies that are clean. And the companies that are clean, they're like, look, I just bought the data from a third party. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's just like they didn't let us know. And, and just like the company just renames itself and then sells the data again to the same company later, basically. Uh, and so that's kind of like the game they're playing right now. But uh, it really depends. Like there needs to be some very big uh, fines to come out of this for for these companies to change because otherwise it's working, right? Uh, but Perplexity, for example, ignores your roles as TXT completely. Like it's like they don't care if you if you block their bot, they will take your data and they will, they even took paywall data at some point. Like you could read paywall articles through Perplexity for a while actually. And this this concept of, uh, regulation or uh, kind of the wild, there being a wild west industry around scraping <laughs> data is not new, right? We've no. seen that with original Google. There was a famous case where they were not Google, but uh, a third party company, which Google paid for data, was scraping a lyrics website. And then Google was displaying, displaying right, lyrics genius. as a fe featured snippet. And uh, so the company suspected this. So they put out some fake lyrics. Uh, the company then scraped these fake lyrics. Google bought those fake lyrics, put them on its featured snippet, and the it got this got pointed out to Google in no uncertain terms. And they're like, "Oh, it's not our fault. We bought this data fair exactly. and square. It's blame blame them." So until that's punished, it's like they will do it. Done. By the time this happens, though, it's already been done, and like yeah. the, the new normal is that all this this lyrics are available for free. And there's the same thing happening with with AI right now. If one company if perplexity gets stopped then a million other or 50 other companies are coming in and doing it anyway so like you, you lose your advantage you lose all your competitive advantage if you if you're too careful here and that's the thing it's like now it's like you first of all we don't know how to remove data from an llm what is it strained it's trained you know it's like you cannot really touch that and the second thing is that we're now using llms to train llms right so like a lot of companies are running out of data to train llms so they essentially generate what they call synthetic data to train LLMs. But what can happen is like, it's basically an old model that generates data that the other LLM just analyzes, et cetera. So it's like, if data was stolen at one point, even if the new LLM is not trained on stolen data, the other LLM that knows about it, that trains that model probably is. And as a result, you cannot get a distilled version of whatever content was stolen. So it's like, I think it's gonna be almost impossible. And it's gonna be distilled so much eventually as the generations of model come out that even if they have a technology that can find, you know, what content was stolen, as it gets more and more distilled through model training, 
it's not going to work. It's going to fail at some point. It's a little bit like detecting AI content. Like it works 50% of the time, which means you might as well flip a coin, you know? Uh, yeah. and, and that's the same result. So I, I like, it's, it's cool that they're trying to do that for publishers, but it looks like a company made by old people who don't understand technology. And probably when you scratch a little bit under the surface, it might not be that good actually, but let's see how it goes. My last question then, does this mean that Ahrefs were correct when they set up yep.com <laughs> as a, uh, with, with an idea to reward creators? Uh, in in some way, because this is essentially the same thing, just not done through mm -hmm. search engine, right? Well, I expect this company is gonna go just as well as Yep.com then, <laughs> because <laughs> nobody's using it. Enough, enough said. There. That's the problem. It's like sharing sharing like ten percent of zero is still zero. Uh, and before you consider even sharing, build a company people want to use because otherwise it changes nothing. You know. Yeah. So yeah. All right. So any final words of wisdom on anything we've covered today? No, I think that's that's it. I mean, it was cool, actually. Let's, I want to know what people think about that format. It's kind of like a more casual way of talking about what's happening. We're going a bit broader, uh, but I think it's time to go broader. It's like uh, we could talk about like s sneaky little tactics. We've done that on many other episodes, but I think if you want to do well in today's world, you need to get that context. Otherwise, the decisions you're going to make for your business, they're not going to uh, they're not going to matter quite often. So, yeah, let's see. Let us know what you think in the comments. And we'll be back in two weeks for another episode. So if you're following along on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. I know 52% of you are not that watch this video. Uh, so please go do that now and uh, we'll see you in two weeks time.